started. Thanks for joining us. Where are you today? I'm in uh, the Bay Area. In the Bay Area. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So uh, Danny Cohen, head of sales and cap intro from Falcon X, is sort of the head of God here with the, <laughs> with the window. <laughs> okay. And uh, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Okay, so we've got a phenomenal panel, panel, panel here. I had a chance to talk to all of them and they have really great personalities and they're incredibly witty and clever. So there's no pressure, guys, but you know, you really are. I can't speak for you, Danny, because we haven't had a chance to talk yet, but the pressure's on. I thought I'd just go down the line and because I always like this, I like to know a little bit more about panelists than just their title and everybody's extremely uh, successful, they've got amazing careers, but there are a few things you might not know. And so Robert, I'm just taking the editorial liberty of sharing that you're a former Marine officer. Wait a minute, you're never a former Marine, right? Okay, well, former Marine, but I thought Marines are always Marines for life. Okay, good. Uh, Super Cobra attack helicopter pilot. Um, the code is just don't piss off Robert. Uh, Neil Schwamm is Head of Operational Risk in L L1 Digital. Uh, that's Asset Web3 Crypto Investor Fund of Funds. And he has a really awesome shoe collection. So I told him if he was a girl, we'd be friends. On top of that, he's a polyglot with lots of languages under his belt. Um, Cedric, Fran Cedric Fan at Russell Investments. He was 18 years there. And he doesn't have Bear Stearns on his resume on LinkedIn, so I'm thinking that may be a little bit of PTSD. And I'll ask some of the guys if you can get some psychedelic samples from the last panel to help you get through it. And he's a dad of three uh, with dance and gymnastics under his belt. I don't know how many of those, but that's beautiful. And then Danny Cohen, uh, you had a front row seat at Bear Stearns as well. I'm sorry I, I can't get you any psychedelics to get through that. I live in California. Okay, so it's, okay, free. Abundance. Anything special you want to share? I am an avid cooker and uh, cure my own meats. Oh, good. So the next party, we're coming to your house. Okay. Yep. And then Chris Solars is the CIO of the Forest Road Company. And I noticed that he had a degree in economics and anthropology, which I thought was super cool. And then I said, tell me something special about you. And he came out so quick and he said, I've done a marathon in all 50 states and my daughter Geneviève. And I was like, oh, come on, that can't be real. It's really real. And he swam the Hudson River 20 miles yesterday. You don't look too bad. The shark bites are all hidden. Okay, fantastic. All right, so let's get started. This is a topic called Evolving Digital Assets. Um, Evolving, did I say devolving? Evolving digital assets, investments, infrastructure, and landscape. And we're going to talk about the differences between traditional and digital assets in, bundle prime, in the bundle prime brokerage model and how institutional investors view the evolution and what the challenges are. But I think we're gonna even go beyond that. And Robert, I already gave you the heads up. As the CEO of Luca, maybe you could just give us a 30,000 foot view of how you see what's going on right now and set it up for us, and then the guys will pile, the rest of the guys will pile on. Sure. Uh, so Can you grab a mic? Yes. I'd say right, right now, and we, I think we mentioned this yesterday a little bit as well, or, or started the conversation, I'd say there's, um, there's temp temporary market conditions that, um, for, for a number of reasons, and, um, Unfortunately, I don't have the, the glass ball on when they're going to end or, or whatnot, but I think we're, I'm very confident that, that crypto is here. I mean, there's, there's absolutely zero skepticism that it's, uh, that it's failing now or any of those rumors. You know, there's a couple incidents like the Terra Luna one that everyone's talking about um, that's isolated and it's one of, of thousands of crypto assets that are, that are interacted that are all designed very differently. So. Um, and, and a lot of the risk associated with that particular one, I, I do believe, could have been um, used uh, sufficiently by traders to, to keep themselves out of, out of a, uh, a very big uh, position that they weren't able to get out of. Um, so uh, I, 
clearly, you know, to state the obvious, everyone's been talking about acquisitions and hiring and, and consolidation that's going to be going on in these conditions. I mean, all of that, we're, we're looking forward to, to some of those things, the, the companies that are still um, thriving right now, and, and it's honestly most of the ones that I see in the crypto industry are. There's a ton of new businesses, financial institutions that are yet to announce what they've been working on for the past year or, or several years and really look forward to seeing them announce it. I'm hoping that maybe some of that will, will drive some, some more FOMO in the markets. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, to, to sum it up, it's the everyone's strategy needs to change appropriately and thoughtfully right now to make sure that they're managing risk appropriately. Um, however, with all of that, there's, there's a ton of new opportunities that maybe we wouldn't have had if these conditions weren't in place. So. Um, I think those that are thinking that way are gonna, we're gonna end up seeing a lot of success um, at the tail end of this. Great, thanks Robert. Um, Neil, do you, wanna, do you wanna just pile on that and add your yeah, sure. 30,000 foot overview, please? I'd make, is this working? Yeah, I think it talks close. Uh, I'd make one comment about crypto now, abstractly, the outside world looks at these currencies as these kind of abstract things that behave on their own the same way we look at any currency in the world and forget that now these currencies, these protocols, in a good way can start behaving like equities, meaning there are teams behind these currencies. They don't exist in the ether on their own. Um, they do have business development teams, they have operations teams, um, and the point I'm making is in any company you're running, when things are going like they are now, you double down on your processes and your people, and you be aggressive. Um, so these currencies again don't exist in a vacuum. There are people behind it that are going to work really hard uh, to make and keep them successful. And pull ahead, the ones that will be more successful will pull away from the others. But I think it's important to uh, to recognize because again, this is something that I think you know people from the outside world don't really kind of make that connection between people involved with these things um, and the technologies themselves. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Thank you. But um, I think, and yeah, to Robert's point, there's a lot of good stuff coming in. Um, there's some maybe less good stuff coming out. If we think about this moment right now, like our firm as investors and also as in some ways a startup ourselves, we've been around for three and a half years. Um, and for those of you that were here yesterday, I may have kind of repeated this, but um, it's a moment to start looking at your processes, your risk management programs, um, where you might have made mistakes, where you might have been successful either by accident or intentionally. Um, and, you know, Robert mentioned FOMO. I mean, when things are good, certain questions don't get asked. Um, certain questions don't get asked because there may not be scope or even time when there's transactions that are oversubscribed, diligence processes uh, kind of get, you know, shortened. Um, things may not necessarily fall through the cracks, but you've got to decide, you know, what you get to ask and what you don't get to ask. Um, and when founders are kind of in the driver's seat, it makes that difficult. Um, things are changing a little now, um, and I think this is, as these moments tend to be, uh, a moment of maturity where professional managers start to recognize what their profession actually is, what they need to do, um, and the type of questions they will need to add, be you know, ready for from investors, but also from the market. Um, Luke is a very good example. Uh, they're very, very important. They play a very important role um, in our marketplace um, in, in certain specific, uh, in terms of their core offering, um, and more broadly, and I think now when you're looking at your counterparties, um, administrators, exchanges, anybody that plays, custodians, anybody that, that plays in that space, um, you start to look at now how they differentiate themselves, how they get their data, how they use it. Um, in the past, it may have been more of not, you know, thinking these things are more of a commodity. Now you start to kind of look at, you know, who's good and why. Um, and I think it's pretty important to recognize. And this, going forward, this is just going to become more important. You're saying risk management is sexy again. Never went out of style. <laughs> it never went out of style. Cedric. I really like um, kind of thinking about the current state of crypto as akin in some ways to the equity market, right? Because you have a bunch of projects and, and as Neil mentioned, you know, there is a team behind each individual project. I think it's important to point out though that, that crypto as an asset class is still small, right? I mean, even when it was bigger, it was what, three trillion, um, you know, the public market cap, I think of global equities 
uh, is something like 110 trillion, right? So it's just a lot bigger. So I think that's actually good for the, the crypto asset class. We've had a number of these sort of down cycles. We've had more projects. Um, it, it kind of allows, I think to, to what my fellow panelists have said, is that it allows certain problems to be uh, you know, solved, right? Th you know, issues to be resolved, you know, stability of the technology platform, for example. It's kind of alarming that you could have some protocol just not trade multiple times in the course of a month. I mean, th this is really not very acceptable. On the other hand, though, I think longer term, um, I think the, the promise of crypto is, is absolutely massive. And I think it, it really may just change the paradigm of how we think about certain things. I was thinking just today about something as simple as settling a trade. Right, because we tend to think in the U.S., um, I trade an equity, right? I buy 100 bucks of whatever. Um, it actually takes still two days to settle that trade, which is frankly ridiculous, right? Why? And so there's a big move now by DTCC to force or to strongly encourage, right, trades be settled within one day by 2024, which still seems sort of ridiculous, right? Why does it take? two days or one day to settle a very vanilla transaction, and why does it still take 20 to 30 days to settle a loan transaction? So there's just massive inefficiencies. I think that you know, the, the reality of crypto trading, we have instantaneous settlement, it just sort of changes the paradigm of how you think about things and, and, and what's actually possible in capital markets. It opens up the ability to trade a broader range of asset classes more quickly. You can maybe tokenize things like privates. This is already happening, and it's, it's really exciting for the, uh, for the marketplace. Yeah. And 24-7 market. Yeah, when I think about crypto today, in June 2022, I think about the old market adage, when there's blood in the street, buy and sell at the sound of trumpets, right? Because right now, it's stating the obvious that crypto is being affected by the global macro environment and by idiosyncratic events. And on the global macro side, we know that we're seeing global inflation. We're at a 40-year high in the US. The Fed is raising rates. And the last eight times we've had a recession, the Fed has been cutting rates. And we just had a, a official equity bear market in the S&P last week. And yet the Fed is on this um, hiking cycle, which is draining liquidity from the market. So we have inflation. We have the Fed hiking rates. And global banks around the world also um, taking out liquidity out of the system all around the world at the same time to try to fight inflation. We, we're still suffering from the pandemic and supply chain effects, number three. And number four, we're, we, of course, have the, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war that has ramifications all over the globe. So this is the backdrop to the equity bear market and the fixed income bear and market. energy prices, seeing. maybe. It would be five. Of course. Yes, thank you. Um, and idiosyncratically, crypto has been had a few black eyes over these past two months. And we mentioned Terra Luna. Um, and when you see a collapse of a stable coin, it talks to the stability of the whole marketplace, right? It's gonna take a little while to recover from, from this one. But the good thing was that no other ecosystem was impaired. Um, it was simply that idiosyncratic event. Number two, the Celsius platform, uh, freezing accounts. This speaks to individuals that were hurt. And the trust in the system, again, is eroded. And then I think number three, um, one of the biggest and most successful um, hedge funds, Three Arrows Capital, that had up to 10 billion in capital, are having their own problems, right? So that's at the, at the token level, right, the stable coin, at the investor level, the retail level with Celsius, and the institutional level with uh, Three Arrows Capital, and all of a sudden, it's, crypto is kind of in a penalty box. People are saying, you know, let's, let's do our research and really make sure we're ready to invest in this asset class. But when I see, if you liked Bitcoin last year at 60,000, you'll love it today at a 75% off sale. If you like Solana, uh, you know, today it's 90% off. And about 75 of the top 100 tokens are now down 90% from where they were. So I'm very encouraged that this is a great time uh, for the asset class and a great time to enter into the asset class. That's great. Danny, I you're on. How you should shrink it a little bit. But um, I agree a with bit everyone. Louder for uh, us. Build, building is really important. Uh, healthy businesses will continue to uh, build uh, the right way in down markets and in the, the exact opposite in the up markets and do it smart. Um, <clears throat> Cedric touched on one thing that's been bothering me for 23 years, which is 
how come distressed bank debt takes 30 plus days to settle? So there's no question that the underpinnings of the technology will blend into the traditional world. But one thing I, I keep thinking about as we continue to talk about the, the risks that have happened in the, in the market over the last month and, and the events is how um, sometimes when you're in crypto, all you think is that it could be uh, the end of the world. But the reality is uh, in 87, uh, the market opened down 22.3% and then circuit breakers were put in. And the Hunt brothers cornered the silver market at one point and they changed the rules around that. And you had long-term, you had Madoff, and a ton of other things in between. And with every blow up, with every lost dollar, there become learnings, more regulation, more risk management, and people get better. And so we have to take these episodes and learn from them, get better risk management within our own firms, everyone's, and the ecosystem itself. So actually look at these things as major opportunities for everyone to get better and smarter. So I'm excited about the future. Great, great. Robert, back to you. You talked about this before um, on one of the panels yesterday was the need for education. So there's that when you talk about Celsius. A lot of people didn't know that they were giving a promissory note and then, you know, good luck, you can do anything with my money, right? And compared to other investments in crypto. So can you talk a little bit about the continued need for education and what we need to do as an industry. I think that's worth talking about. And I know we're going a little bit off topic here, but we've got extra time today. Sure, I mean, this, this uh, technology, and I'm deliberately using that word because I, I don't believe this is an asset class. I think that's a perfect example of, of how there's more education needed. I mean, all of us just use different terms to describe the same thing right now, um, which everyone does. Um, whether it's a cryptocurrency, it's a crypto asset, there's all different other flavors of them, or they just, uh, whatever the underlying asset it was to begin with before they tokenized it. And I think it's some of those things, I mean, begins with very, very simple, you know, basics here. I think that we're, even how you framed the question earlier, you said, you know, we're comparing crypto. When we look at equity markets, we're usually poking or uh, you know, pointing fingers at individual companies, like you know the Robinhood incident that happened um, recently. Um, we're not talking about all of the other listed publicly traded companies that are on the same exchange, right? But in crypto, everyone tends to generalize and and just put all of these into one big bucket, and they're they're not. They couldn't be more diverse from each other. Um, so I think it, it starts. I mean, education is it's it's going to be continuous. The last year, I think, was a huge um, development in education. A lot more businesses and individuals got involved in crypto and finally figured out that there's more than one crypto asset. There's more than just Bitcoin out there, um, which, by the way, Bitcoin does not have an organization behind it, and it does represent more market cap than all the other assets, I believe. So there's a, you know, I mean, it's these, these little subtleties, though, that make a big difference. How are you, you know, how are we going to manage risk associated with Bitcoin compared to Ethereum that has a foundation behind it that the SEC can call, you know? Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll figure out all of this, but it begins with some of the basics. I think I'd like to see a lot more collaboration between standard setters, regulators, governments, and, and all the, the private businesses that are out there, because there's a ton of knowledge and, and all of those working hand in hand. Um, instead of with scare tactics, I think would be a, a much more productive outcome. And we're, we're seeing a lot of it with a lot of regulators are very collaborative. Um, I think standard setters need to catch up. They're all putting it on their agendas and, and things like that. But that's another key piece that's, that will help everyone. So. so that's a good point. It's education. Um, Neil, can you talk a little bit about your firm when you're, in, when you're evaluating digital assets directly or through external managers? What are the key differences that you're looking for from an infrastructure perspective versus investing in traditional alter alternatives? Yeah, if you look at the way a traditional hedge fund set up, and Chris mentioned, you know, going back to the 1990s when kind of like the traditional hedge fund industry as we know it, and al traditional alternatives was kind of like invented or really came into maturity. Uh, versus where, say, similar funds are now that invest in Web3 and crypto. Um, 
So the similarities are you're looking for kind of the same components of running an asset manager. Um, you're trading in the market, you're settling trades, you're reconciling, you have an administrator, you have a board, you have a custodian um, in some sense, you have data providers, you have data transfer. Um, those components exist, but they potentially exist in, in different ways. Um, in traditional markets, those components are fairly well commoditized, i.e. there's several incumbents that kind of run the game. Um, and you can see actually in traditional markets on the administration side, they're so commoditized that it's actually very hard to even be profitable. So then they end up rolling up and now you have like one or two fund administrators that basically do everything. Um, in crypto, it's not at that level of maturity yet. Um, each one of them potentially offers uh, a different value proposition. Um, you know, part of their edge could be that they're just better marketers, they have better networks. I mean, that's typical in all nascent industries. Um, I think it's important to focus, though, on, on the custody side. Why? Because it's the one, it's very important, clearly. Um, it's also potentially the most differentiated within crypto than versus traditional alternatives. When you're looking at custody, um, one of the considerations is you don't necessarily have a lot of choice. And when I say a lot of choice, this is actually dependent on the strategy as an asset manager. Um, it's not a given that the, uh, the protocols that you want to invest in will be supported by every custodian. Um, if you're generally early investors like we are, what you may find is that uh, they're supported by no custodian, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. That's n normally you're taking a different type of risk where you will have managers that we invest in that will have what's called self-custody of assets. They'll use something like a hardware wallet or ledger with their own internal infrastructure that depending on the sophistication of the manager is very similar to what an actual custodial operation does. I mean, to be clear, what custody does in crypto is a custodian is effectively holding your keys to the network um, is kind of the way to synthesize it. In traditional markets, they actually have the securities or they manage the ledger. Um, so this is, and again, the keys in traditional in, in digital assets are your access to the ledger, but it's important to differentiate because if they go bust, they don't hold the assets. They hold the keys, but the assets don't necessarily go down with them. The same is in traditional markets, but it's the access that's important. So to, su to sum it up, um, you've got to consider the, the relative strengths um, of the service providers you're working with. Um, versus the strategy you're going to launch. And I think it's important to notice, and I, to note, and I said this yesterday, right now in the, uh, in the industry, there is a very high demand to onboard with custodians, banks, administrators. Um, there's a huge backlog. So if you're launching a fund, one of the considerations is your timing. You may not be able to get everything done in a month. It may take six months. Um, to get onboarded with a bank. Why? Because uh, if you're a bank like Signature or Silvergate, um, you're OCC regulated, you're a bank, you have compliance standards, and people think crypto is the Wild West. Um, on the KYC side, I can tell you it's not. Um, so you get an extra level, a layer of scrutiny, and that can take a very long time. Uh, and those banks also are having really high minimums that you're having to put through the system now. They won't even take under a certain that amount. Yeah, so that's that another too. point that you Finding have to banks think about. To meet all the needs of just a fintech that isn't really regulated, like all these other, is hard enough. I mean, we're opening up offices around the world. It's, it's amazing how there isn't a bank out there that can enable us to accept crypto and, and fiat um, in a global footprint. It just yeah. isn't out there. That's, that's an opportunity that's, for that's some exact. really smart entrepreneur in the audience. Um, Chris, I wanted to ask you a question. That, so just to tag on to this. So, one of the things we talked about before, how should institutions gain access to crypto? We're talking about the infrastructure stack. How do you th see it? VC, spot, crypto-focused hedge funds? Kind of, can you dovetail on? Yeah, sure. Um, I think institutions, and when I talk about institutions, I'm generally talking about um, family offices, multifamily offices, and ENFs. Those are the first ones who've really accessed this market. and. Generally, they've gone the VC route because they're very comfortable with VC. VC is kind of a set it and forget it. Um, they invest. You know, it's a seven or ten year investment vehicle. Um, they're expecting big outsized returns, and they know it might go to zero, but they're diversified and it also might go up 10x. 
So they feel it's a very comfortable bet, and they're comfortable with that return profile. Um, so we've seen a lot of, uh, right now, the biggest, the, the size of the, the market is really um, the largest funds are all on the VC side. And that's where a lot of action is. What I think is very interesting, so I, I, I divide it into three buckets. I call it directional illiquid, like the VCs. Um, directional liquid, almost like um, ETFs or passive ownership or spot investments. And then finally, crypto hedge funds. And the first two, directional, give you the beta of the, of the asset. And VC is trying to add alpha on top of that beta. Um, what I think is the most interesting for me is on the crypto hedge fund side. And we've almost replicated the, in the, um, the bucketing of the, the contemporary hedge fund universe. Right, so today the coin pickers, they are yesterday's stock pickers. And in the arbitrage side, we have exchange ARB, and we have DeFi lending ARB, and we have cash futures basis, which is essentially fixed income arbitrage that we, that we know today. And then we have special situations and event type traders, and they're doing the exact same thing that hedge funds have been doing for 30 years. But the big difference is that alpha is so plentiful in the hedge fund space compared to the contemporary space for, for hedge funds. And if I just give a little bit of an example there, um, up until this month, um, I had been in the traditional hedge fund world. For about 20 years, I was uh, working for fund of hedge funds and consultants that advised institutions on direct investments into hedge funds. Um, and we wrote a paper um, a few years ago that analyzed the alpha of hedge funds when you strip away all the observable betas. And that's really the dirty secret in a lot of hedge funds is that they're masquerading beta as alpha. But when you strip away the observable equity beta and credit beta, what you're left with is the residual. And if that residual is positive, it's, it's alpha. And some of the very best hedge funds over time, it's almost surprising to say this, but they make three to 400 basis points of alpha annualized each year. That's not very sexy. That's after fees, though, but it is real, and I think it goes to show how hard it is in the traditional space that's very competitive to have an edge compared to other institutions who also have all of the same edge. They've got uh, economists that used to work at the World Bank. They've got a team of 15 analysts. Each of them are subspecialized in, um, in, in telecom semiconductors, and together they can only produce three to 400 basis points of alpha. And when I see the, hedge fund, uh, the crypto hedge funds today, they are able to produce, this sounds silly, but like 50 to 100% or more percent of alpha, you know, thousands of basis points worth of alpha. And it's not that they're any smarter, it's that the assets that they're trading are so much more receptive to an institutional framework. So today, I what, what do you mean by that? Talk a little more about that. Oh, sure. I mean, it's a nascent asset class. And if you have an institutional process where you can separate market movements from fear and greed, when you can be um, stoic in your investments and do the same process every single time, do your, all your DCF models, use your technical analysis, do all your components to come up with uh, a rigorous and systematic way to do investments, which is, I, I would like to think that's what every hedge fund is already doing. When you do that, you can you can win <laughs> on, the, on the hedge fund side. So we see a lot of hedge funds because they're not competing against other institutions. They're competing against retail that's already made 10x on their investment and they're happy to leave 10% on the table as they, as they sell out in, in one large chunk. So the hedge fund side is ripe for alpha. And I think all of the, the underlying stories of blockchain that, that, that Ced Cedric mentioned and the other panelists have mentioned, they're ripe for the t disintermediation of large swaths of the economy. So that's the alpha play, and you've got the beta play. So between the two, you've got um, you know, a lot of exciting potential investments. I love it. Uh, Danny, we talked about this before. Uh, vehicles for institutions, this is kind of a segue to gain exposure to the asset class without setting up custody, wallets, keys, and eliminating the challenge of setting up a whole operating infrastructure to trade and custody digital assets this is kind of the opposite of what we were talking about earlier. Can you weigh in on that? Yeah, and that's, it's actually an extension of the alpha conversation. And um, 
we at, at Falcon X, we, we became uh, the first crypto native uh, registered swaps dealer under the CFTC. And, and, and a lot of that, um, the drive to become registered came from uh, two, two pieces. Number one, um, there was a huge indication from our client base that they wanted to not have to build operating infrastructure to, uh, to, to, to basically express views within the digital space. So not just touching spot, but also uh, becoming Delta neutral and uh, mixing in some leverage staking along the way. And so uh, those opportunities uh, we had really looked at uh, for our own, you know, for our own use, right? Uh, there's a lot of folks within the walls here at Falcon X that love to trade. We can't trade perps or futures or options. Uh, we're all sitting, most of us are sitting in the U.S. and just don't have access to that. And, and structurally, uh, these transactions, even on an, on an unlevered basis, are giving returns that outstrip that 300, 400 basis points of, of alpha that we're talking about in the traditional sense. And, and that's not just um, in sort of the smaller, less liquid cap names, that, that's all the way up. Now, now basis has uh, uh, gone away uh, on some of these names, uh, specifically mid-December. But look, the ability to, uh, for not just hedge funds that are large filers in the US, but global banks to express views, whether it be smart, smart beta, um, delta neutral, uh, relative value, uh, without having to build the infrastructure, uh, it does a couple things. It gives people more time to figure out and understand how to build these things. Uh, it gives time for uh, the, uh, the the folks to um, to sell this to their retail base and for regulation to. Uh, to improve, but most importantly, um, there are opportunities out there that were being left on the table. And so I'd say we're, we're about eight or nine weeks into this uh, new world of being uh, regulated by the CFTC and uh, is the backlog is, is, is high. Uh, that's driven from banks uh, who would like to back to back uh, these swaps into structured notes and sell them to qualify purchasers. It also is sort of the absolute return top 100 large quants that are sitting in the US that would like to uh, express their views. So I think it's a big release valve for people. And um, then it becomes a, a credit due diligence exercise with your counterparties. Okay, awesome. Um, Cedric, maybe you can dovetail on this. How do you think, now we're talking about in the, in the trading space, how do you think about cross margining? For example, if you own physical crypto in your custodial wallet, and then you do some risk offsetting trade through the futures market. Is there a mechanism to get any sort of margin relief from a broker? Well, I mean, there, there, there may be, I, I don't know. Be, I, I look forward to talking to Danny about this afterwards. I mean, it's, it's something that you see in traditional assets, but getting back to what Chris was saying earlier though, um, in some sense, because there's such volatility in the asset class and um, because it's so retail dominated in some sense, your need for really complicated thing, you know, cross margin agreements is lower because you don't need to use a lot of leverage to make a lot of money. Um, so I think though that over time, as the asset class become, well, asset class, all due respect, I guess, Robert, we can, nomenclature is important, right? But as the technology matures, right, then I think you're likely to have an erosion of the easy alpha. And then at that, in that situation, then you're gonna need kind of more of a traditional prime brokerage model, and then you have to have to think, okay, so what, what do prime brokers do for clients, right? Something that Danny and I have, have direct experience from the old Bear Stearns, but they offer really a number of benefits, right? So there's the obvious ones. So the, one of the obvious ones is um, the ability to have a large entity stand between you and the exchange. So you don't have to open up the account or the on an exchange or the equivalent on, on some sort of crypto protocol. So that, that's, that's, one, that's one advantage. The other thing is it also allows you to trade OTC very efficiently because then you have, again, that, that kind of entity in the middle that's sort of doing its own credit evaluation of, of counterparts, making sure that the people you trade with are legit and you kind of trade under the credit line of the, the, kind of the um, intermediate agent, right? So those are really important. But what's also, I think, important, and that doesn't necessarily get talked a lot about, is trading efficiency. So if you look at how equities are traded now, 
versus like say in the 1990s, it's really different. So you know, we have a huge equity trading desk at, at my firm, Russell Vestment. We do a lot of transition management. We trade trillions of dollars worth of stuff every year, um, almost all of which is sort of listed equities and, and you know, liquid bonds and things like that. And there's a lot of nuances to understanding how to trade. So I had, a, I had an interesting discussion with our head trader a few months ago. I asked him, so how much value do you get from good execution on, let's say, a plain vanilla large cap U.S. equity portfolio, and he smiled and he said, more than you would think, right? And this is important because um, nowadays when you, have hedge, when you talk to hedge funds, which is kind of where I grew up, kind of like Chris, you talk to them how they trade. On the equity front, for most generic things, you kind of hand off your order to your prime broker, who then kind of runs through their, their algos and then kind of trades for you to get best execution, right? And I think this is going to be a service that I think going forward is going to be really imperative for the crypto industry. To, to, they're going to need to solve that problem for clients. Like, how do I know I'm getting best execution? Because maybe you don't, may, maybe, I hate to say it, but maybe you don't really care. If your account's up 500% and you're sloppy by 5%, maybe you don't even know, right? But when the ARB goes down and the alpha gets eroded, then actually that 500 basis points actually matters a lot. And so I think that there's going to be tremendous opportunity for the new crypto prime brokers to add a lot of value by evaluating sort of counterparty kind of credit worthiness, but also helping people trade. I mean, anyone who's, who's traded crypto directly, it's kind of a fun exercise. You know, even for a retail person, it's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of an exercise in, 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 hey, you know, kind of look at the order book, but there's got to be a better way. It's got to be done systematically. And, uh, and I think that's a huge growth area for the, the PB space going forward. That's yeah, great. it's already happening, by the way. I sorry, to, I just want to yeah, just come way up in, Danny. on top. Of that. Yeah, the the, um, the the TCA requirements for trading is they're there. Um, I'm asked every single day, and you know we we really only deal with institutions, and uh, as FDIC insured banks and and large uh, large uh, broker dealers and uh, and hedge funds are there. It is being demanded, and, and as all of you know, as a retail investor, it doesn't feel great to go out and transact on DeFi. Slippage is huge, and uh, transaction costs are, are very high. So uh, I, I see everything happening from the old world uh, very quickly in condensed amount of time in terms of efficiency and, and reporting. Great point. So Neil, what skill sets and approaches are portable? And where is the learning curve when we're talking about the similarities of investing in traditional alternatives? So commodities. Say what skill sets are horrible? N or? <laughs> no. Portable. Oh, portable. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of portable skill sets, I mean, yes. When you think about it from a risk perspective, I mean, fundamental risk pr management principles apply across the board. Um, and again, I mentioned it before, but you talk about processes. Um, but I think, so what's portable is when you start thinking about counterparty credit risk, I mean, thinking about it in the big picture is, uh, is one of the most portable um, skill sets that you need across the board because again, looking at your counterparties, uh, again, custodians, um, OTC desks, anybody that's providing you any type of leverage um, is, uh, is portable on, in the big picture, but when you get down on a more granular level, um, information that you might think uh, would be readily accessible is not accessible. So where's and, the learning curve then? Well, the learning curve is, among other things, understanding, um, among other things, like tre treasury management, I think is, uh, and this is something I think that, you know, you're, you're heavily involved in. Um, the learning curve is understanding how your counterparties run their businesses. Um, because right now they're fairly opaque. Um, the businesses are small enough where they're small enough to be nimble. Um, they get some rope in terms of the type of practices they can implement uh, to maintain their businesses. And you mentioned 3AC. I mean, you, you're going to see now the players that were, you know, really part of the, the market structure, um, what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong. Um, managing their own treasuries, and that maybe this isn't a, exactly a skill set, but it's a factor to look at. Um, if you have crypto native firms that have compounded huge returns on their own books, um, Either they're getting paid in fiat and or crypto, or they're taking fiat and leveraging themselves into crypto or some hybrid of the two. Uh, they may end up with a lot of crypto on their books that they are counting on to fund themselves. Well, guess what? 
um, you're at a moment where that's not longer, no longer going to be possible. Um, so number one, they don't have the runway that they expected. Uh, number two, they can start losing their staffs because, uh, and this is something actually to look at right now, and I think this is, uh, when you see migrations and any market disruptions, it's an indicator of something. But I think right now, if you see good people leaving what were previously considered, you know, good, solid, I wouldn't want to say reputable, but um, established firms, um, it gives you some sense of, uh, you know, what the growth trajectory for those firms are. And um, as you pointed out, things happen very quickly in the market. Um, so these firms, as quickly as they grew, some of them can, you know, pretty quickly ungrow. Um, and some that's of them something... have big surprises on tax bills as well, on top of not being able to pay staff. Uh, yeah, that too. We didn't think about that stuff. But that's yeah. a whole other right. issue. Robert, based on what you heard, give your comments. Anything that you see around the corner that's going to be a challenge, how would you plan moving forward? I mean, kind of how we began this, this panel with, uh, you know, with everybody's watching right now, um, they're liquidating where they can so they can, um, you know, they can adjust appropriately. And, and I mean, that is a perfect time. And we're seeing more customers now that maybe were procrastinating on cleaning up their back office and their taxes, like you just said, right? It's, it's the first thing that gets ignored when your business is thriving, right? You're focused on revenue and your front office. Um, and uh, and so now we're we're I mean we're already seeing that happen and so um, obviously that's good good for Luca. Um, sometimes negotiations maybe we have to offer our products a bit a bit cheaper because negotiations are are tighter. Um, however, there's a lot more demands and now there there are people that have time to actually do a lot of this or they're looking at cost cuts so they want to you know automate their back office and, and things like that. All of that though. Uh, I think is going to be a big theme coming up while we watch the consolidation. And, and honestly, I think a lot of these new businesses that we haven't seen in the public yet that are that have been in the works, I'm hoping that that's going to create you, some, you keep some new, this new out. momentum. I think you need to give some specifics. Everybody, every, there isn't a bank out there that isn't. If there's a bank out there that doesn't, isn't working on launching a crypto business, you're, you're one of the only ones. So. Okay. So what would that look like? Just give us a little bit of future view. What kinds of things do you think are going to be coming out? Well, I mean, and, and I'm talking about the biggest, you know, the large financial institutions that are that have, you know, 20 businesses all under one umbrella. So we're it's not across the board, of course. We're seeing, like was pointed out earlier, fund administration, custody in some new ways is is uh, is moving lightning fast. I mean, I think that's one of the the uh, the farthest along um, segments of that have been embracing crypto assets, and it's it's due to demands when there's all these funds that are being formed. To, to trade these and, and hold them, all the, the service providers in the background need to, need to jump. Um, but we're seeing uh, a lot of the, the brokerages as well right now. I'd say a lot, some traditional ones that are just adding crypto into their current offerings. Some other new ones have, have, been, uh, have been launching. Um, and, uh, and then from there, I'll, I'll be curious to see payments evolve and, and some of the more uh, traditional banking and lending products because we've seen the the crypto native versions of them that were a bit more innovative and, and, and some of them struggling right now. Um, but we haven't really seen much from the, the traditional players in that space. So I'm, I know I'm watching, curious, yeah. curious for that. Danny, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, I echo that. Um, there, there are many banks all have uh, a lot of different uh, work streams going. And so um, we're seeing interest from uh, private wealth, right, in, in the structured note space. We're seeing a lot of interest in the swap space for hedging and also in what I'll call uh, the mid markets, the, the introducing uh, prime broker space where um, there, there are folks out there that have gotten really ahead of the curve like Cowan um, and they've created Cowan Digital and then some of the players that uh, are their competition uh, potentially are looking to do fully disclosed model with firms like Falcon X where they introduce their clients to us. We take on the risk, we enable them to trade digital assets and open up um, all the options here and um, you know, negotiate some sort of split. And so I, I think part of this is out of necessity to be in, there, in the business and not lose their clients and others have uh, the desire to hedge their banks and their firms for the next 10 plus years. Oh, interesting trend. Um, any of you seeing 
interesting trends in that direction right now? I think prime brokerage is going to take a while. Like universal prime brokerage is going to take a while. Um, you've got, if you're a custodian, the next natural step um, in terms of, you know, the core business that you have in terms of profitability, because custody does ultimately become commoditized. Um, it's an AUC product, assets under custody. So you're seeing it's kind of a race to the bottom on margin. Exposed. That's right. That's right. Um, but again, because it's crypto, you have direct access to the assets that the market wants. Um, so anyway, prime brokerage is really the next natural step in evolution for every custodian, but they're all doing it in different ways based on different skill sets and, and differentiators. Um, so in terms of a universal prime brokerage model where you have you know, cross-margining, cross -margining, it's gonna be elusive. I mean, we've been hearing this for years and, um, and it's happening, um, but it also takes a different type of investor in those businesses to understand exactly what they're funding when you don't have a bank behind you with a huge balance sheet that can carve out enough of the balance sheet to support that business. And it's got, I mean, we're talking about big numbers here. Yeah. Um, you know, you need, I'm just going to throw you some numbers out there. You need a couple of billion dollars just to basically absorb potential losses um, to even like be active in the market. And the volatility is so high that it's just, it's, it's, it's Yeah, tough. there's lots of action. Plus yeah. there's nuances to crypto as well in terms of um, um, basically who is effectively doing the lending. Um, when you have like retail, which holds a lot of the coins that are holding wallets and private vaults or things like that, you basically need zero knowledge solutions in order to do like basically credit, the counterparty credit assessments. Um, and there are, there are firms that are solving this problem, but it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that it's going to take a while. I mean, especially for some of the legacy players. I think everyone kind of knows kind of where we're headed. Um, and so we kind of know as industry, you know, we're at point A. We need to get to somewhere way beyond point A. But there's going to be complexity to that. I mean, I think it's very instructive um, that, you know, a, a giant firm, just on the custody side, like State Street, had to effectively outsource right, to, to that firm, I think it's called Copper, right, because they didn't really have the intersection expertise. They were very, on the panel yesterday, yeah, Copper. Yeah, it, it would have been very difficult for, for them to do it on their own, right, and, and, and so I think that as we kind of look forward, um, there's all kinds of questions about technological interoper interoperability, right, I mean, you know, the, the banks are not really set up in a lot of ways for, like, real-time settlement, right, so tracking these things, like, because you, you, you have trade date, you have settlement that T plus one, T plus two, T plus 50 for some of these distressed bank loans or whatever the case may be. But this has to be addressed going forward. And so you have to change your whole model of just even the basic things like reporting, right? Um, cost basis tracking. It's just, this is, these are non-trivial things to do when you have to redo your entire architecture, right? And, and so I think it's a really interesting space, but yeah, I agree with Neil. It's, it's gonna take a while. We're not, it's not like this will be done in three to six months. On the other hand, there are, there are certain specialist firms, like, like Danny's firm, that you, know, you have kind of the edge, I think, of, of being able to do things brand new. And that, I think, is um, an edge. But on the other hand, though, you do need to have a fair bit of capital, right, to be able to do what you need to do to kind of be a full service prime broker in kind of the traditional sense in the crypto space. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of innovation when you talked about just setting, just coming up with a price. Right. Yeah, I mean, to, to piggyback off what you're saying, I mean, the banks, most, most banks, their infrastructure can't handle more than four digits after the decimal place. A couple of them have five. I mean, that breaks Bitcoin, let alone, you know, all the Ethereum-based assets that require 18, for those that, that aren't aware. Um, and they'll say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll divide or we'll multiply and we'll, you know, but they run out of digits one way or another. Um, the infrastructure was just not designed with that. I mean, there's very material companies out there that have have data products that shut down on weekends. Um, there's ones that there's hard coded things into fund admin software, big providers that you know that prevent um, all kinds of things that crypto asset transaction data requires inherently. Um, that's the whole reason why Luca exists so for everyone is, is to solve some of those problems. And uh, and so if you think about what banks are doing right now in order to get to market, in order to serve their customers, um, many of them had innovation labs for years. Many of those didn't really result in much. Some of them have, or some of them turned into more internal consulting shops where they're just doing vendor assessments. Um, 
but uh, but the banks, I mean, I, I think with the climate right now, I'll, I'll expect and to form a true prime broker in the space. I mean, someone's going to have to roll up one of each of the types of businesses that you need to make up the whole pie, I don't know, in my opinion. And, and uh, maybe now is the climate where we'll start to see some of that or some of those strategies unfold. I would make one comment to that. I think what's also underestimated or not well understood is normally in an efficient market for talent, it's just assumed that you'll be able to fill positions. Um, it's in crypto, and Robert, you can probably speak to this directly. If you think about not just a typical bank employee, but how banks compensate people and the skill sets required. Um, if you look at people finishing you know, MBA programs over the past 30 years, the migration from consulting to investment banking to VC to private equity, now to crypto, um, hedge funds in there in between, um, to get the skill set that is required to innovate and keep pace in this space is very similar to the skill set that a crypto hedge fund would hire. So if you're making the well, choice, I thought you were going to say a 20-year-old engineering grad, no, who's or, or, that, or, or that, but I'll just or, but, but that's the point. Or their that, dorm that's, room. That's, well, I'm just giving an example of, yeah, in the MBA space. But yes, a 20-year-old grad, that guy doesn't want to work or, for. Or that gal, she doesn't. That, she knows more than your average bank right. CEO about crypto. Right? Not only that, she doesn't want to go work for State Street. She wants to go work for. Luca or, you know, another fund, um, and they want to get compensated that way. But anyway, there's a, a whole bunch of parameters around, you know, what they consider the work environment for them. So when you have, you know, these kind of older type of institutions, they've, they're bureaucratic in their very nature. But in terms of being able to hire and service their own clients, it's a very difficult proposition, which is, I think, to Robert's point, where that's where you get the roll-ups, because you just, you have to acquire the talent um, and compensate them, uh, you know, yeah, retention. retention. Retention is yeah. so much more important. Yeah. Right. Especially when people move jobs every two or three years, and in crypto, it's like two years. Why didn't? Why not six months? Um, so to get onboarded with processes of traditional banks, you know, their way they onboard people, train people, promote them. It's just a very different cultural. Program. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole new world with talent. For like, I don't care what industry you're in. That's all you hear about is recruiting, and then getting them up to speed, and then retention. It's I don't know what the magic bullet is today. How, how are you yeah, thinking? And about one that? issue for retention ship within crypto funds today is that with everyone's high watermark being down 50% lower, um, you've got PMs that are looking realistically at getting paid, and perhaps they won't until they get to their high watermark. And it's very easy for them to jump ship, perhaps start and have a different new baseline and have a right? different right. Everybody start, was going to leave and, and have fresh. a new baseline. Right? So we're seeing a lot of movement underneath yeah. the. Uh, some from very some of the you know from some of the top talent at a lot of these these firms are are moving around and starting their own firms. So do you because you have a fund of funds, do you track that specific talent and where they're jumping to? Is that something that you do? Yes, absolutely. That's that's exactly what we do. <laughs> Just checking. Okay, you'll have to tell me later where to go. Uh, Danny. Weigh in on that, on the talent piece. How are you guys doing? How many open positions do you have? And what's going on over there? How are you attracting and keeping talent? Or are you? Yeah. No, we, we are. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, my, my sales team has uh, 12 people on it now. We're, we're expanding to over, over 20. Uh, with a very concerted effort on the go-to-market strategies. The firm itself is strategically hiring in, in, in all places. Look, when, when you, you find the right people to do the job, um, the thing that's hard to put a, a present value in, in dollar terms is how, how that puzzle gets put together with the culture that's built here or in, or in any firm and how those people are additive to what you're doing. I think somebody on the panel talked about the difference in culture between the crypto world, which does not shut down, uh, and the traditional world, it's, it's, it's a mental shift. And you know, what I see here, people, um, and just not here, but in the space, people are step up, they're willing to work, they have to work, market goes down uh, in size on a Friday night in December at 9 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, everybody's engaged. Um, part of it is, is they believe uh, in what they're doing, they believe in everything, um, they want to be doing this. So um, I think that's the thing that you just can't put put a dollar value on and, and that kind of helps lift entire firms up and, and retain people. 
Yeah, I think that, that's great to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, okay, so let's look into the future. We're in our last chapter of the panel. Uh, I just want each of you to weigh in and talk about what you think you're, we're going to see over the next three years and pick it however you want, but ideally, things that would be a good takeaway for the audience. I mean, I don't, I don't think we've seen what is going to disrupt next. I mean, we're, I, think we're, uh, I think all this technology and innovation is going to lead to something that we haven't seen yet, and so I'm, I'm very excited to see what, whatever that is. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas and issues, I know, with just what we're doing now, but um, I'm sure someone is, is inventing something right now that, that's going to be uh, more impactful than what crypto has been so far. Can you then look at it from the perspective of what you see the most burning needs are, maybe the top three that the industry needs to have? You've talked about standardization, you've talked about education, but maybe a bit more specific. You just listed two of the three that I was going to... Oh, sorry, um, I didn't mean to steal the fire. <laughs> you could say it again, though. We can pretend we didn't right. hear it. And risk management. I'll throw that one in there again. Um, but specifically, we've got, honestly, so, so many smart people that know financial risk management. Um, and uh, in the, the technology and the operational risk, risk domains are, uh, are the ones that I think aren't, aren't, aren't looked at as closely enough, considering literally this entire ecosystem is sitting on top of technology and operational risk. So. Okay, great to hear. Thank you. Neil? Yeah, I would echo that uh, 100%. Um, I think to temper expectations in the crypto space more broadly, on the one hand, three years is a long time, as we've seen. Um, but I think in terms of like broader adoption, um, it's still going to be a while. I mean, I think we're, it's still going to be uh, years before crypto itself becomes something that you know, more people are using on a regular basis, um, meaning that these are, these are kind of generational bets. So um, do you th what's going to take the foundations and the really big institutions that already are not in crypto, they're sitting on the sideline, what's it going to take for them to get in? Well, demand from their customers. I mean, they're, they're feeling it now, um, but I think, you know, from a generational perspective, when they start seeing people in their, say, late 20s, early 30s, not opting to do business with them because they opt to build their wealth and store it in a different way, uh, then they will really start to take notice um, that their business models are. You're not saying regulation. Not. Is there a reason? Uh, no. Well, that too. That too. I mean, I think that's one. I mean, I, I see. Actually, that's less than three years. I mean, regulation is coming very quickly, um, and that's a good point. Um, I think uh, you know, with the the new bill, whether it you know goes through or not, um, is not really the point. Um, I think it's uh, you know first and foremost on a lot of people's minds. This is a moment where it's. I think it's natural for regulators to actually start taking notice. Um, and actually, the fact that regulators are taking notice is a good thing, because that means the market is big enough that it's starting to mature. need protection. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Danny, you're nodding your head. You want to look, at, yeah. look into the future, look at your crystal ball on your desk that we can't see. Tell us what the next three years look like in your mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, based on the, the, the data points I see from our clients and, and, and prospects and, and um, look, the blend of the old world and the new world will, will come together. I think Cedric talked about this a little bit with um, the tokenization of other products and asset classes. I think when we talk about digital assets and broader tokenization where um, any tradable asset on the planet will be tokenized and traded 24/7, and I think efficiencies that 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 blockchain give to this um, will, will they will all come together. Uh, I won't make a call on price or anything like that, but I will say that um, that regulation is welcomed and needed. Um, I grew up in a regulated environment for for 22 years and regulated again and, and I just think the more the the, the better here uh, we need customer protections on the retail side and more more structure for um, you know for the institutions and just for fun where do you think Bitcoin will be in three years oh I'm, I'm done I'm out of that game I'm long I'm holding I'm not selling so are you uh, a, are you a, thir are you 30 still years, buying fine it'll be a gift to the kids okay still buying all right Either of you want to go next? Um, 
Maybe my three-year prediction is the institutionalization of crypto as an asset class. Because I think collectively, um, the financial media and investors are really taking this asset class seriously right now. Um, collectively, it's about a $1 trillion asset class. And for comparison, high yield is about $1.2 trillion. So we're right there. But right now, when I look at um, asset allocation across um, institutional investors, almost no one has a sleeve for, for crypto. So my prediction is that in three to five years, it will generally be accepted alongside a private equity sleeve, a venture capital sleeve, a hedge fund sleeve, and a similarly sized crypto sleeve. Um, right now, when you look across public, um, uh, uh, public investments in the US, you hear about Fairfax County, who made investments um, early, and you hear perhaps about Houston firefighters that made a $25 million Bitcoin investment, but that's it. But I, I happen to know many of the, the, the public pension funds have all started their own digital asset working group, which is a cute little acronym called DOG. And you know they're all looking to prepare for when they will start investing. And I think it will be almost like the breaking of a dam. We'll see one really big public pension plan. Just need CalPERS to get started. That's right. And then everybody else follows, or TIAA. I, I think that's right. I think we're going to see it being generally more and more accepted. And this is not even so um, out there to say, you know, I think you could, if we have real, you know, crypto maximalists, they'll say, well, all equities will be trading on the blockchain. And perhaps corporate treasury of uh, any corporation will, will see this along the capital structure. They might issue debt, equity, or crypto. And I think that that perhaps has a place, but maybe I'm going just only halfway there to say that uh, within the next few years, we'll see mass adoption of crypto as an institutional asset class. Are you long Bitcoin? Yes. Are you buying? I am buying. What's your three-year price target? 250K. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was sitting What about three years in a day? <laughs> three years in a day? <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. Cedric. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Chris. I think that this is going to be a much more widely accepted institutional investment class. And I think that the reason why it hasn't hit there yet is that um, for a lot of investors, they look at it and say, well, we don't really understand like what the, what the real use case is. Here's something about NFTs and what's the Bitcoin thing. And there, you know, there's a little bit of confusion there. But I think as we see blockchain technology, right, going back to Robert, what you said about technology, not an asset class, getting more widely disseminated and used everywhere. I mean, there's all kinds of use cases. People finally will realize, oh, well, this is actually a real thing. It, it is transforming a big chunk of our economy. Right? And I think because of that, people say, okay, well, I could get indirect exposure by buying the S&P 500 and get some exposure through Tesla's ownership of Bitcoin or something, right? Or maybe I should just go directly into crypto. And I think that's where people will go eventually. So I think it's going to be one of the things where it's going to be pretty incremental moves, and then there's going to be a big change up, is sort of my prediction. Now, it won't necessarily be a, a huge part of a portfolio, but it's one of the things, it could be, you know, zero, 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 10 basis point, 2%, It might like be that. where all your alpha comes from. Maybe. <laughs> if if, uh, Chris is, if Chris, Chris is right, where alpha is coming from. Um, anything controversial? Well, first of all, let me ask you first, Bitcoin, are you long? I am. And where, what's your three-year price? Well, that's, that's a tough one. Um, north of where it is today. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I, I would say uh, I'm not as optimistic as, as Chris. I would say probably 100K. Okay. Anything that you're thinking of right now that's kind of controversial that other people are not thinking? What's your contrary view to anything right now? Well, I mean, I think, um, I don't know if it's a contrary view or not, but I just, I, I do wonder about security going forward, about the move to quantum computing, because you know, you're going to have to find a, a, a new um, cryptographic method to secure the chains, right? Because with, you know, I don't know how close we are, but we're probably closer today than we were five years ago. It's a great about developing point. actual crypto kind of, you know, hacking technology. It doesn't exist today. It probably actually that exists we know conceptually of. somewhere, right? Exactly. And who knows? Maybe someone's got it. I think that needs to be addressed. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, they're already talking about the new standards, the new cryptographic standards are super important, but I think people are going to have to have a lot of certainty that those keys are, in fact, you know, unhackable for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, 
Vadik, are we wrapping up? This is. Okay. Okay, guys. Any last words that you want to leave the audience with? Danny, you want to close it out? <laughs> pressure. I mean, it's uh, no, just, just so cool to, to see you in, in live, you know, in San, Fran in San Francisco or wherever you are on the West Coast. Maybe having taken psychedelics, maybe not. I just <laughs> thought it'd be a nice way for you to close out from California. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody for A, for being flexible and dealing with me on Zoom. And um, I think I speak for the panels. We love to talk about this stuff, um, about market structure, not just about our firms. And if, if anybody wants to, to follow up, I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure we could have a deeper conversation, although I'm definitely not qualified to talk about quantum computing and um, hacking keys that are sharded. Uh, so I'll leave that to, to Cedric. Leave that to the professionals. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it. I think the audience got some wonderful takeaways from this today. I've, I'm leaving with 250K as the Bitcoin price. I don't know. Chris, thank you. you. Made my day. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.